<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very pleased and honored to be able to introduce Larry to you. Um, in fact, I've, I'm one of the admirers of, of Larry. And, and let me put it this way, why I admire him so much. It has to do with his capacity to be a thinker and a man of action. It's quite difficult to combine these two. Most men of ac action are lousy thinkers, and most thinkers are bad men of action. And here we have somebody who can do both, and who can excel at being a great academic researcher. He has done a lot in economics research, and also be at the forefront of action, policy making in several um, administrations, US administrations. Um, he was, as you know, uh, Treasury of the Secretary under President Clinton um, during the 1990s. Um, he was later Director of the National Economic Council of Pro President Obama, so he has been there much of the time. Um, but he is a thinker. Um, he has been president of Harvard. Um, he has published widely in, in many different areas in economics. And his connection with LSE is also something that I think he, he feels emotionally about. He has been here several times, several occasions, both uh, visitor and, and, and giving lectures. So I'm very pleased that today he's back um, talking about uh, issues that he has been um, thinking about and working about. And um, oh, by the way, before I, I start um, with uh, questioning, I'm, I'm supposed to announce that the hashtag for today's event in Twitter is LSE, LSE Summers, right? So uh, Larry, let me first take up the issue of secular stagnation. I think, to, I think I am supposed to say that my Twitter something, I don't know if it's my handle or my hashtag or what, is at, a, at LH Summers for anyone who wishes to follow uh -huh. um, <laughs> such tweets as I choose to put out. And I'll also just, just say before we go to the first uh, question that I am really glad to be here and be glad to be here with you, Paul. I think the world has learned a lot from your work about the role of confidence crises within a current currency union and your insights were really quite seminal in that regard. And I'm very glad to be at the LSC. Um, perhaps the, a high point of my youth was the year I spent in London in 1966 and 1967 when my father was on sabbatical at uh, the London School of Economics, and a high point of the early phase of my academic career was the six months that I spent on sabbatical at the LSC in uh, 1987. And so I, am, I have returned a number of times uh, since, but I'm very glad to be back here on this stage on this occasion. Okay. So we are on a stage now. Um, so <laughs> let me first go into this issue of st secular stagnation. It's, a, in fact, a very old issue, but that you have taken up recently, right, and gained a lot of um, <coughs> audience and also discussion, leading to, to great discussions about what's going on. And when you hear the term secular stagnation, there is this term, this word secular which means very long run, right, like a, a century long. So, uh, I mean, just the etymology of, of the term. I understand that you mean something different. What I've seen from your writings is that uh, there is a lot of emphasis on, on the demand side, the, the, the fact that on the demand side, after a financial crisis, there are mechanisms at work that can keep you, can keep the economies in a low growth, high unemployment equilibrium. But many people will associate secular stagnation with, with other things, like more on the supply side, right? Uh, 
things that have to do with technological change and population growth. How do you combine these two? How do you, how do you see that so that the notion of secular stagnation could be clarified? Look, uh, Europe is not growing and is on the brink of deflating. And the situation is basically, from the point of view of real economic performance, been fluctuating a bit, but fluctuating around a static to declining trend for more than half a decade. Japan has very substantially lower nominal GDP than it did 15 years ago. In the United States, our measured output gap has declined since the trough of the recession in 2009. But that decline is wholly the result of downward revisions in potential, not of growth at rates above the potential growth we saw at uh, that time. Markets have moved in remarkable ways in the last uh, year. In, in Germany and Japan, interest rates are, 10 year interest rates are well below half their previous level. In the United States, we saw the end of QE and the tapering. We saw a significant acceleration in GDP growth. And we saw the 10-year interest rate decline from 300 basis points a year ago to 180 basis points right now. All of that suggests some tendency towards a chronic excess of saving over investment with the consequence of a significant shortfall in aggregate demand. That conclusion is reinforced by thinking about the years before the financial crisis. Think about the United States between, say, 2002 and 2007. We had the emergence of substantial budget deficits with the Iraq War. We had the mother of all housing bubbles. We had a vast erosion of credit standards. We had what John Taylor lashes out as excessively easy money. And all of that taken together was enough to produce adequate economic performance, certainly not an overheating uh, in the economy. In retrospect, it is clear that the success of the European Union in its first decade rested on pillars of sand in the form of unsustainable vendor finance by the north of Europe financing uh, the south of uh, Europe in ways that were not sustainable. So it's not just that we have had slow growth in recent years. It's that when we had reasonable growth, we had to have unreasonable borrowing in order to uh, support it. And that's why it seems to me there's a deep question about the ability to maintain adequate sustainable demand within our economies. And I think the best interpretation for why long-term rates, long-term real rates, and long-term inflation expectations have collapsed over the last decade, through, uh, last year, throughout the industrialized world is a growing appreciation of the seriousness of these forces. Now, to your question, Paul, is it on the supply side or on the demand side? Simple-minded economics would tend to tell you that when you have growing deflationary pressures, that tends to tell you that it's a shortage of demand, that if you had growing inflationary pressures, that would tell you that it was a shortage of supply. That's why I emphasize the demand side. But I think it's actually more complicated uh, than that. Um, and this goes back to Hansen. Uh, 
one of the important reasons why the demand for investment has fallen off is that when you have a shrinking labor force, you don't need as much investment to equip your new workers as you do when you have a raise, growing labor force. When you have a slower rate of underlying productivity growth, you have less uh, natural investment demand pressure than when you have a more rapid rate of productivity growth. So I would certainly be the first to agree that there are factors on the supply side that are contributing to the reduction in demand that is in turn contributing uh, to this phenomenon of secular stagnation. But the observation that it is the specter of deflation which uh, haunts us suggests to me that one has to give substantial weight to demand factors. And it seems to me that while in my country, you can say, you know, we had a 5% GDP quarter, what are you talking about with secular, stag secular stagnation, that you have to look at what's happening in markets, and it is telling you that uh, for a decade, the, in the United States, as in the rest of the industrial world, the Fed is not going to hit its 2% inflation target for a decade. And that specter of deflation is what makes me think that secular stagnation, in a way that is at least closely related to Hansen's original notion, um, is likely to be uh, an important economic problem uh, that, has to be, uh, that has to be reckoned with. Now, I would not say, just to clarify one thing, um, you said, uh, we live in an age that moves pretty rapidly. And so I have no clue what the defining problems are going to be for the next century. I will regard myself as having been validated in my warnings about secular stagnation if the liquidity trap and the zero lower bound on interest rates and the concerns about deflation are a persistent aspect uh, within the next decade. And beyond that, I wouldn't presume uh, to judge what the pressing economic issues will be. So some optimists will say, well, technological change uh, is there. And, and do, do you give lots of weight to the idea that, uh, well, new technologies might at some point lead to new investment booms, right? kind of uh, a new wave of, of uh, investment that is associated with rapid technological changes. Some optimists will probably counter that. Let me say two things about that. Um, first, uh, there's a huge amount of intellectual talent uh, seated in the audience uh, here. If someone figures out the answer to the following question, it will be a major contribution to understanding our current economic situation. There is, on the one hand, a vast sense and a large number of examples suggesting that information technology has an increasing capacity to replace human workers. Automated cash registers in uh, stores, no more distribution system for books because they can come on uh, the Kindle, radiologists reading, uh, machines reading x-rays instead of radiologists, Google self-driven cars replacing uh, chauffeurs, the airport working much more efficiently because my boarding pass can be on uh, my, I, my iPhone, and vastly more. So on the one hand, there's a lot of reason to think and be concerned about the displacement of labor by uh, technology. On the other hand, measured productivity statistics are, if anything, down and terrible. And so how does one square substantial displacement of people by technology with 
very poor performance of output per hour. And I think that's a very, very, you know, some of it may be mismeasurement of the out, some of the answer may be mismeasurement of the output, some of the answer uh, may be new jobs being created that have benefits that aren't easily measured, some of the answer uh, may be that the technologies are less pervasive than their proponents uh, suggest. But to really get at your question, I think you have to reckon with that tension that I just described, and I have not seen a good reconciliation of that tension. Having said that, I think there is an aspect of current technology that makes me quite doubtful that secular, st that secular stagnation will be overcome by technology, and indeed makes me think it might be reinforced by technology. And that is what I would call the demassification of the economy. Think about this. The Sony Corporation is worth $18 billion. It has tens of thousands of employees. It has factories. It has office buildings. It has all the stuff that you'd think a big company would have. WhatsApp could comfortably locate itself, all of it, its computers, its people, its everything, in this building, probably in this room, actually, uh, if you made a floor out of the upper balcony. They could fit all 55 of their people with their workstations there, and it is worth $19 billion. Um, a decade ago, if you wanted to start a startup, you needed five or $10 million. Today, you can start, if you have an idea that you think is the next Facebook, you need a $500,000 seed money to start, uh, to start it. There was a time, it's, it's, I remember it, most of, the, most of the people in the audience are too young to remember it, there was a time when IBM was sort of a dominant company in the United States. When it was, it was always borrowing money in order to raise the funds, in order to make substantial investments, in order to expand. That was what was happening when AT&T was the dominant company in the country. That's what was happening when Ford Motor Company was the dominant country, company in the country. Apple is the largest market value company today. It is rolling in cash. It cannot figure out what to do with all of its cash. It is threatened by Carl Icahn, who thinks that they have to use the cash to buy back shares. But in the meantime, the cash sits in US Treasury bills. Google is a similarly large-scale company with a similar kind of dynamic. The relative price of capital goods has fallen very substantially, which means that a dollar of savings buys you much, much more capital than it used to. And look, that's not hard to understand. See this thing? This thing has more computing power than the Apollo project did. <laughs> so something really deep and structural has happened, and it probably operates to change the savings investment balance in a way that produces a change in the real interest rate. And that's very much at the essence of this phenomenon of secular stagnation. Right, and how do you get out of this? I mean, traditional public investment or um, votes or, or? The three ways, the three broad concepts for how you get out, I think, if you accept this broad view. There's patience, and this too will pass, and it's really not all the stuff you're talking about, Larry. It's really just understanding the legacy of the financial crisis. And once you work off the legacy of the financial crisis, things will go back to being OK. And people proclaim new eras a lot, but they're usually wrong. And this will sort of work itself out. And that could turn out to be right. The Japanese have been hoping it'll turn out to be right for 25 years now. <laughs> 25 years. I mean, when the new Clinton administration came to power, in 1993 in the United States, we did a big survey, the International Economy, Economic, 
international economy exercise. And our conclusion was that growth in Japan would be between 3 and 4 percent over the next decade. It's, in fact, been less than 1 percent over the subsequent uh, 25 years. So it might be that it will all work itself out. And, you know, it, there were, it's certainly true that growth in Britain has surprised on the upside over the last couple of years. I think that's mostly because the extent of fiscal consolidation has surprised on the downside. But um, it could happen. That's, that's one strategy, basically hope, structurally reform. Yes, structurally reform will, might be deflationary, but it'll make people feel better, and it'll all be okay. That's a strategy. Not my strategy, but it's a strategy. Well, in the case of Japan, it seems to be all right. I mean, they have had deflation during 25 years, but uh, unemployment is low. Unemployment is low. They seem to be happy. Well, it's hard to know. They, <laughs> It's, it's hard, it, it, is, it is hard, you know, it's very hard to evaluate these things. Um, at some level, there is a certain contentment. Uh, nationalist elements in Japan are stronger than they've been uh, in uh, 25 years. Japan's place in the sun in the world is not what uh, it, uh, once was. 20 years ago, people, 25 years ago, people were writing books about called Japan as number one. People were talking about emulating the Japanese model. None of that today. So I, I don't think it's been an easy period for Japan, though I think you're right that particularly if you make adjustments for the demography, uh, Japanese performance has not been as problematic so it's not as a many, catastrophe as many thing that one associates yeah, although with one deflation, right? Uh, one doesn't, it depends on, it's certainly not been a rapid motion catastrophe in the way of 2008 or in the way of 1931 to 1933 in the United States. It certainly also has not remotely lived up to the expectations that anyone in Japan had in 1991. And if you had described to anyone in Japan in 1991 what the next 23 years would look like, including an increase in their debt to GDP ratio to 250%, they would have found it to be a horrifying prospect. Mm -hmm. But you're right. That, so that's a strategy. Second strategy, which is the one that's more in evidence, is in essence, well, we have a Big excess, yes, there probably is a tendency towards an excess of savings over investment. But if we just get enough interest rates down enough, we can fix it. And yes, it may be that the short term government bill rate is zero, but there are other bonds that contain term premiums, that contain credit risk premiums. If we just use quantitative easing with sufficient vigilance, or if we make sufficiently credible promises that we will keep inflation going whenever we have a chance to get it going, we can push real interest rates down low enough to eliminate the potential imbalance between savings and investment and provide effective uh, stimulus. Second line of argument. Compared to doing nothing, I am all for quantitative uh, easing uh, policies. But they raise the questions, how much lower can you push interest rates, particularly I think of continental Europe where French 10-year rates are 60 basis points and Spanish 10-year rates are lower than uh, British 10-year uh, uh, rates. How much investment is there that businesses will not undertake at a 1.5% interest rate that they will undertake at a 1% interest rate? What will the quality of the investments that, that are not worth doing at 
but become worth doing at 1% be? What will the consequences be for sustainability of expansion of the leverage and asset price inflation that will naturally be associated with driving interest rates and term premia to extraordinarily low uh, levels? What are the consequences for fairness of having assets have a very, very low denominator in the valuation formula? You know, any asset can be valued as some kind of cash flows in the numerator divided by some kind of discount rate in the denominator. If you drive the denominator very close to zero, you can drive the valuations very high, but you're raising questions about volatility, you're raising questions about risk, you're raising questions about distribution. So on balance, does it seem to me that it is better to be engaged in more expansionary policy rather than less expansionary policy? Yeah, I think it does. But I'm probably more worried than the average about what the efficacy will be and a bit more nervous than the average about what the potentially toxic side effects on financial stability will be. Now, some people will say, well, okay, that's not such a big problem. Uh, just have the really easy policy and then have macroprudential regulation. Well, you know, the, the track record of successful macroprudential regulation is, shall we say, limited. The previous heroic story which was told ubiquitously in the um, middle part of the last decade was about the brilliance of the macroprudential policy represented by Spanish countercyclical capital requirements. That was not, in retrospect, hugely successful um, in avoiding real estate bubbles and the like. So on balance, I would certainly think that erring on the side of expansion is the right side. But I think there's a limit to how far it goes. The third strategy is uh, to put it in the terms of the intermediate textbook model is to pursue strategies directed at shifting the IS curve to the right, to pursue strategies directed at promoting um, investment so that you achieve full employment at a higher level of the equilibrium uh, real interest rate. And there, there are obviously a number of strategies. Uh, in my country, I think the place you should start is with uh, public investment. As I've said many times, if a moment when we can borrow money in a currency we print ourselves for 10 years at 1.8%, at a moment when male non-employment is at record levels, is not the moment to fix Kennedy Airport. I do not know when that moment will ever come. <laughs> and you can say the same thing about 30,000 schools across the country with chipping paint. And I don't think that your country is entirely immune uh, from infrastructure deficiencies as well. I don't understand, you know, when I was in school, they, we spent a certain amount of time talking about uh, the phenomenon of repressed inflation. Repressed inflation is basically when you print a lot of money and you don't want to have inflation, so you have a price control. And basically, the repressed inflation is worse than the actual inflation because you get queues and black markets and all those kinds of things. Well, just like there's a concept of repressed inflation, there should be a concept of a repressed budget deficit. When you put an arbitrary fiscal target in place, and people meet the target by deferring maintenance, the burden on future generation grows at a lot more than the zero real interest rate that's in place in most of our countries. When you meet a budget target by promising pension liabilities in the future, and cutting compensation in the short run, 
you are doing our children's generation no favor. When you cut back civil service salaries and allow the quality of the civil service to deteriorate, you are placing a larger burden, not a smaller burden, on uh, the future. So it seems to me that adequate investment in infrastructure at a time when net investment in infrastructure in the United States and the United Kingdom has rarely, if ever, been lower relative to uh, GDP, more adequate elimination of the various practices that I've characterized as representing repressed uh, budget deficits, and measures to promote uh, private investment. Look, a time when there is too little investment and therefore people are out of work, that is the right time to replace all the old coal-fired power plants that are wrecking the planet. And there is plenty of work to do. There's plenty of very valuable things to do. We just need to be willing to make those kinds of investments um, in uh, the future. And it's a matter of both public, inf public investment and I believe also a matter of freeing up barriers uh, to uh, private uh, investment. But it does require understanding that what is probably the most single most important price in any economy, the price that connects the present with the future, the interest rate is telling us something very, very powerful about savings and investment. And in that context, we need to move beyond the kind of Calvinist idea that more savings is always good and uh, that borrowing is bad. Because what we have right now, in important respects, is a chronic excess of saving. And at least judging by the market evidence, it's likely to be with us for some time to come. That's why I couldn't agree more, but it will be a difficult act of convincing. Um, and I'm thinking about the German government that considers to be a sin to issue debt. So if, if, you, if you want to do an investment project, but you have to issue debt, that is sinful. We will have problems convincing these people there uh, to, to go in the direction that I think is the the right direction. But maybe I can turn to um, another. Your country, uh, your country and my country were parties to a substantial relaxation of German debt burdens mm -hmm. in the 1920s, and the again in the 1930s, and again in the early 1950s. That was not because of a view that before those debts were incurred, Germany was without sin. <laughs> it was because of a view that enlightened statesmanship required looking forward rather than backwards and thinking about how best to craft a system that would work for everybody. Whatever the sin has been in Southern Europe, is it too much to ask that Germany take a forward-looking view of a common European destiny in thinking about macroeconomic policy going forward, rather than retaining a green eyeshade 
accounting mentality as populism, radicalism, and nationalism spread across uh, the continent. It may be too much to ask, but we can all hope that ultimately it will not be too much to ask. Can I ask you a last question that has to do with the report that you have been issuing? Uh, you, you are chairing the Commission on Intrusive Prosperity, and it has come out with a report that I would like to recommend to you. It's, it's full of um, essential thinking about uh, how to make it possible that growth will be shared among the whole population and not just the top one or whatever percent of the population as it is uh, in many countries these days. But one thing that fascinated me when I was reading the report is the following. Each time you come up with solutions, also in the previous discussion we had, the role of government is key. Right? Yet I see in Europe, and also in the US, huh, um, such a distrust about governments that I wonder whether what you propose as the solution can ever get off the ground, except if we can change the whole narrative about what governments can do. Because today, the perception is these governments are just inefficient. They should be reduced, etc., etc. Look, I, I think the paradox of our times is this. The left argues that markets pervasively fail and need to be supplemented and regulated. And they are winning that argument. The right argues that governments systematically fail and cannot be trusted. And they are winning that argument. <laughs> and when both sides win the argument, little wonder that there is pessimism about the future, distrust of institutions, and an instinct towards uh, radicalism. And so I think you're right. Uh, Paul, that um, part of the progressive task, and it's a task that people who are policy-oriented intellectuals uh, like me um, don't tend to gravitate to, and that's a weakness, is effective public sector management and uh, functioning because I think that is essential. Let me give you an example. Um, I go to New York a lot for various reasons. There's a shuttle that flies between Boston and Boston and New York and Washington and New York. It's LaGuardia, you know, it's a major airport in the United States. There's a shuttle, a lot of people fly there. Really a lot of people fly there. Really a lot of people fly there. If you get off the plane and you go to where you could claim your baggage, and get a taxi. What you would normally do is take an escalator to down. Where the escalator would normally be, there is a, it's all boarded up, and there is a sign. The sign has been there since October. It says, new escalator coming spring 2015. Now, if you think about it, a government that takes six months to put a new escalator in, in the airport, in the country's major city, probably isn't going to enjoy a fantastic reputation <laughs> as a competent executor. <laughs> and that is not a wholly isolated example. There is a bridge opposite my office. Some of you have probably visited, uh, visited Harvard. I know Nick Stern uh, has. Danny Qua was a graduate uh, there. Danny Qua, I'm sure, walked across that bridge 
on dozens if not hundreds of occasions. It is across the Charles River. At that point, the Charles River is 330 feet wide. And it's a bridge that normally has three lanes of automobile traffic. That bridge has been under repair, necessitating that the automobile traffic be limited to a smaller number of lanes for two and a half years. And a phone call reveals that they expect it to be under repair for another 18 months. Now, I wondered about the capacity for building bridges quickly. And so I did a little bit of research. And I learned that over a span that was not 330 feet, but that was more like 800 feet, Patton had built bridges across the Rhine in 23 hours, <laughs> not 23 months. And over a span that was three times as long, actually five times as long, Julius Caesar, <laughs> before the bulldozer was invented, had built a bridge in 10 days. Now, at one level, these things are funny, and you know, it's like kind of funny, haha, when Ronald Reagan used to say, you know, great American joke, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Um, <laughs> but, but I don't know, I'm not a manager. Um, I don't know exactly how to fix all of this, but this is a really important part of the progressive project. And I think a great deal of it lies in making these things work better and finding ways towards more effective um, public, uh, more effective uh, public sector uh, management. Um, and I think it's something that's very important uh, very, very, very important for us to do if we're going to be able to build public support for uh, the kinds of policies uh, that many of us in this room would support. At the same time, let's be clear about another thing, though. I mean, I just told some stories that were pretty horrifying about government, and I've got more. But let's also be clear about something else. You, and I don't know the details, uh, I once did and I've now forgotten them, but you in some significant part move towards private sector mandates and personalized accounts as your provision for retirement system here in Britain. We have maintained a traditional pay-as-you-go social security system, where taxes go in, then they go out to the beneficiaries. There are lots of different aspects that go into comparing them. But here's one that seems relevant. In our public system, of every dollar that gets paid out in taxes, more than 99 cents gets paid as benefits to somebody. In the countries where um, we have like the marvelous market and private sector and choice and all those things, there's no country that has that where for every dollar that gets paid in, as much as 90 cents gets paid out in benefits. So it is a mistake to assume that somehow whenever anything is done by the markets, it's always done with some remarkable and far greater efficiency. And I think that is a story we need to tell. That kind of story is a story we need to tell even as we do focus on uh, the problems with uh, government action. Okay, thanks, Larry. Um, I think it's time to open the floor. And I would like to invite you to raise questions. Please let us know your name, your affiliation, and there are roving microphones. Yeah, please. This gentleman. 
Thank you. Um, Marco Triano from uh, Scope Ratings. I just want to take you back to the savings versus investment excess and whether you think that might be related to uh, the polarization of wealth in the last two decades. Because in the end, you know, investment is a function of future demand, which in turn might be a function of disposable incomes. Thank you. Yes, I think one of many factors is that uh, redistribution of income upwards has led to some increase in the propensity to save. I think that's one of the uh, factors, along with the uh, falling price of capital goods, slower, popu slower uh, population growth, more savings in uh, developing countries that's led to lower equilibrium interest rates. Yeah, I do think that's an aspect of it. Yeah, please stay. Yeah, Bernard Casey from University of Warwick and LSE. Um, I want to pick you up on public investment as the uh, option. Um, you, to you talked in terms of basically infrastructure investment. At a little later stage, you talked about what needs to be done and you talked about effective public sector management being required. I would be interested in your views on this fashionable concept of social investment, which is a bit more than a physical investment, and its contribution to um, new ways of public sector management. Supportive agnosticism. Um, I don't know enough about it to have a hugely well-developed uh, opinion. I think, and I think the word social investment get u gets used to mean many different things. I think it's a mistake to fetishize uh, bricks and mortar over uh, human capital. And so to the extent that it means uh, enhanced investment in uh, people, I tend to be uh, supportive. Uh, I certainly would recognize the role for uh, what my friends would call collaborative governance. Uh, meaning various kinds of partnerships between uh, the public and the private sector or the public and the nonprofit sector to carry out the kind of investments uh, that, uh, we're to, uh, that we're talking about. Although in general, I get a little nervous when things have too many objectives because it's a little bit like uh, I discovered as a university president that there were a number of professors who really liked having appointments in two different places in the university because then whenever they were absent, they were always assumed to be at the other place <laughs> when in fact they were at neither. And uh, so when you have an enterprise, when you have an enterprise that's supposed to make, that's supposed to make profits while promoting uh, while uh, promoting environmental values, well, if, it, if it's not making profits, that's because it's promoting environmental values. And if it's not promoting environmental values, that's because it has an obligation to make profits. And so I get a little nervous. Uh, double and triple bottom lines can sometimes become no bottom lines. And so I'm a little bit less dewy-eyed with respect to some of these ideas than some of my friends. But I think, it, I think these are areas that are very much worth exploring. I have a lady in the back there. Thank you. Puma Chemist from OMFIF. Um, I have a question on the effective management uh, and functioning of the public sector, which you mentioned. Um, do you see sovereign funds, sovereign wealth funds, taking or playing a bigger role in this particular aspect? I mean, we're seeing specific funds like Kazana, the Malaysian sovereign wealth fund, where I'm from, um, has a development agenda and it helps the government with domestic investments, particularly in infrastructure. So do you see this uh, particular group of financial institutions, the sovereign wealth funds, playing a better role in this? Thank you. I think they're I, my guess is that sovereign wealth funds will grow relative to global GDP in the years ahead, certainly broadly construed to include central bank reserves. I think that they will increasingly be dissatisfied with the zero returns that are available on uh, short-term financial instruments. And I think they will recognize that if you don't need liquidity, you shouldn't pay liquidity premiums. And so they will seek to diversify into less liquid and more risky uh, kinds of uh, investments. 
My hope is they'll do it on a largely economic basis. My concern is they will do it on a more political basis. And uh, in an earlier writing, I referred to the phenomenon of cross-border nationalization uh, to get at some of the aspects uh, that are potentially uh, problematic. Uh, when a sovereign wealth fund um, invests and owns 9% of a U.S. company, do we want the ambassador of that country to be using the political leverage of that country to advocate for a tax break for the company in which that country is substantially, uh, in, uh, substantially invested? So I think this is an area where there's considerable need uh, for care, but I think one of the things that could be an important contribution uh, would be more aggressiveness and more willingness to take risk on the part of sovereign wealth funds uh, going forward if those risks are taken uh, competently. Uh, the history in your country is, um, shall we say, mixed uh, with respect to uh, the prudence of all of the investments of its funds that have been undertaken over the last uh, several, de uh, several, uh, several decades. Okay. You, you, yeah, Danny. Thank you. <coughs> Danny Kwa. Larry, in your roundup of worldwide secular stagnation, you told us, describe the situation in Japan, Europe, and the United States. Well, of course, Asia is a massive uh, part of the global economy now. In the last w IMF World Economic Outlook, the emerging markets in Asia are in total a size at nominal GDP market exchange rates as large as that of the G7. In the five years following the global financial crisis, it was China and other emerging economies that contributed many times to global economic growth than the United States. I wonder if your assessment of secular stagnation extends to these emerging markets. Do you think it is merely convergence that's going on there? Or is there something profoundly different going on in that part of the world? I don't really, I don't completely know. Uh, in a way where I have high confidence, which is why I didn't have anything to say uh, about your question, uh, which is obviously a very important one. I think it's notable that the group of countries you describe, despite its enormous economic energy, rapid growth, much lower per capita income than uh, the industrial uh, countries, uh, and much younger population structure has nonetheless been a net exporter of capital rather than a net importer of capital. And I suspect that has something to do with an export-led growth development strategy. And that kind of export-led development growth development strategy is more problematic uh, when the potential de export destinations are in a demand short <laughs> in a situation of being chronically short on demand. So I think that where they're gonna fit into the picture is that the pressures are going to mount as they already, as they already have in both J Japan and China for a, ex for a growth strategy that is in aggregate less export led. And I think that would be an important contributor uh, to uh, the global development to the global development process, and I think that's underway, but I think it's probably, un it's gonna probably need to be underway over a longer time period uh, than, uh, the, than, it, than many people imagine. I mean, to put that in a, uh, to put that in a different uh, way, um, it may be masked and it may be changed for some interval because of what's happened to oil prices. But if one thinks that a crucial part of the European growth strategy has to be a decline in the euro and an increase in the external competitiveness of, the, of Europe, one has to ask the question, so if Europe's going to have a much larger trade surplus, what's the other side of that going to be? 
And I think the most natural answer to that question is a larger trade deficit or a reduced trade surplus on the part of emerging markets, and that's how they fit into this story. Okay. Lots of hands. Yeah, this gentleman at the end. There. Uh, thank you. Uh, John Young, uh, with reference to the report you co-authored with Ed Balls, my question is, um, what fiscal tools do you consider to be most effective in combating inequality, be it here or in your own country? Thank you. I think the most basic and direct is uh, moving towards more tax progressivity. And I think there's substantial scope uh, for moving towards uh, more tax progressivity, both through closing domestic loopholes and uh, through uh, greater international cooperation to prevent the evasion of taxes through international mobility. The latter is not a matter where the UK is entirely innocent. Let's uh, give a chance to the people up there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, do you see the privatizations in Russia as having been a success? <laughs> Compared to what? <laughs> I, I think that uh, there's no question that the way in which uh, they were managed created substantially more uh, enrichment of uh, some of those fortunate enough to uh, be the purchasers in those privatizations uh, than uh, would have been uh, would have been desirable. On the other, would have been ideal or would have been uh, desirable. On the other hand, I think that a judgment about the privatizations and a judgment about the Russian strategy needs to recognize that uh, the institutions under state control had become extraordinarily dysfunctional uh, to the point where. It was not uncommon for workers to um, take uh, burnt out light bulbs from their house, bring them to work, take the functioning light bulbs from their office, and replace them with the burnt out light bulb. And that is an example of what happens when enterprises are run with no ownership interest that is oriented to the future. So there was a great deal of pressure, uh, and I think legitimate economic pressure, towards uh, rapid privatization. But in retrospect, uh, could the privatizations have been managed more successfully for the benefit of uh, the state? Yes, one certainly wishes they had been in the political conditions that prevailed in Russia. You know, that depends on how you define uh, what the uh, constraint, what the constraints were. Uh, is there any evidence that American advisors counseled in favor of the practices uh, that led to unjust enrichment? Uh, I'm not aware of any such evidence. I have time for one more question. Um, lady at the end here. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Summers, um, President Barack Obama will be delivering State of the Union address later today, where he's expected to unveil uh, several initiatives about uh, introducing talks on wealthy people and using this money to help the struggling middle class in America. How these initiatives correlate with your uh, research uh, conclusions? Uh, because your report is also about helping the middle class, low and middle uh, income people. And do you think the initiatives proposed by President Obama today, uh, do they have any chances of being implemented, considering that for the next two years there will be a Democratic president and a Republican Congress? Thank you. I'm, of course, not familiar with the details of President Obama's uh, initiatives. But based on press reports, there's a substantial correlation between the kinds of ideas that he's advancing for a more progressive tax code combined with more support for middle class families uh, 
and the kinds of ideas that uh, were introduced in uh, the Inclusive Prosperity Commission. That's not because our efforts were coordinated with theirs, but because, you know, uh, his thinking and our thinking were led, I think, to, uh, to, similar, con to similar conclusions. Um, will, it, will it happen? Uh, the Republicans are in a majority in Congress, and certainly the Republican uh, commentary on the proposals has been, to put it mildly, less than effervescent um, <laughs> over, the, over the last couple of days. On the other hand, I think it's very difficult um, to know uh, with respect to these uh, respect to these things. Um, Rudy Dornbush, um, the international economist, had a proposition he used to enunciate with respect to financial crises that I have found helpful in a much broader range of contexts. Dornbush used to say, Things take longer to happen than you think they will. And then they happen faster than you thought they could. And that's right with respect to various kinds of technological innovation. And I think it's right with respect to changes in the political atmosphere. I think that, I think there's a pro, I think that you never know, and I think there's a, uh, Prospect, you know, it, quite a remarkable thing happened. I mean, Mitt Romney, remember him? <laughs> um, Mitt Romney, you know, he's the guy who talked about the 47% who were the takers. Remember him? <laughs> he has signaled that he is running for, that he may well be running for president again. And if he does, the centerpiece of his presidential campaign will be, he says, new government action to overcome poverty in America. Jeb Bush, Jeb Bush's political action committee is called Right to Rise, referring to the importance of equal, uh, referring to the importance of equal opportunity. And his speeches are all about the stagnation of middle class wages. And so I think we have seen a sea change towards the price of admission to American political debate being a recognition that income growth for middle class families is the central economic challenge of our time. And once there is that recognition, it becomes harder to defend um, solely trickle-down strategies. And so I can't predict what the next law that will pass will be or whether any law will, any law will pass. But I think if you've watched, to an extent that has been surprising and has been gratifying uh, to me, the set of questions around middle-class incomes and the related set of questions that have distributional implications have really become uh, quite salient. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to come to a close. I found this uh, very stimulating, um, fascinating to listen to you, Larry. Um, you're a very busy man. Uh, you landed in London and now go taking off to Davos, where you will meet all these world leaders. I hope you can convince them to, to move in a direction that you have been outlining here for us. Uh, so thank you again, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you.